me and Jesus, we got our own thing going. Might have a certain truth to it in one sense, but it's not the whole picture. Christians live in community, and we have responsibility to all the various elements of our community. And that's what we're talking about today And Dig Deeper. We are stewards of our community. Hi, I'm Pastor John Rallison from Journey of Life Lutheran Church in Orlando, Florida, and you are listening to Dig Deeper, our weekly Bible study that uh, uses this Sunday morning sermon as a starting point to jump off and do a little deeper study. Sometimes it goes directly along the lines of the sermon, only deeper. Sometimes it takes the opportunity of this longer uh, time format to go off in some different directions, which is what we're going to do today. So as any of you who listen to this normally know, we also use this uh, for small group curriculum. And so several times we stop in the middle for questions uh, that groups will discuss if they're using them in that way. And that's what we're going to do now. Stop for our first question. The opening question is this. What are some of the different communities you have been part of? And I'll see you in seven seconds. So we're doing this sermon series as a part of the series called The Summer of Stewardship in the core verse that we're using is Psalm 24 verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And as I say every week, I want to sort of give you a quick recap. Uh, We began this uh, series by noting that yes, uh, he's got the whole world in his hands, but he has really placed it in our hands and given us responsibility for all sorts of things in our lives. But on June 8th, we explored the idea that God hasn't just tossed it off to us and left us to figure it out. He's given us uh, what we need to be good stewards. And then as the Sundays went on, we talked about how we are stewards of the good news. We are stewards of our own bodies. We are stewards of the conflict that comes our way. We're stewards of the next generation and we're stewards of our hearts and attitudes. And this week we're talking about how we're stewards of our community. And a steward is someone who manages the property of someone, somebody else. And that's what we're doing here. We're looking at our lives really as uh, things that have been, and all the parts of our lives, as things that God has placed into our hands to be used according to his design for us and our lives. And that's kind of twice over because he first created us, and so we sort of owe that to him because he's the one who actually made everything. And then he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us. And so we are bought back from our rebellion and welcomed anew into uh, God's presence. And and in a deeper way, even than before, we're called his sons and daughters, children of the king and and heirs of the kingdom. And so we want to be good stewards of all the different things God has placed into our lives, including what we're talking about today. Our community. So part one is going to be a little bit of a recap from the sermon for those of you who uh, either listened to the sermon or go to church at Journey of Life. Of course, if you go to church at Journey of Life, I'm hoping you listen to the sermon if you were there. Um, but be that as it may, we start out now with part one. Love is at the center. Love is at the center of the community of Christ. If we read through the scriptures, we find that love is the central characteristic of Christian community. There's all sorts of things that go with Christian community that we are going to talk about, but it can all be wrapped up and summarized in that one word, love. John 13, verse 35, Jesus told his disciples this, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And so Jesus identifies love as the core attribute of the community of his followers. And then Paul, writing to the Christians in Corinth, reminds them that without love, everything else loses its meaning because love, again, is the core attribute of the follower of Jesus Christ. And so love is the core attribute of the community of Christ. And of course, this comes out of us being rescued by God, our love for 
our communities flows out of God's love for us shown in Jesus Christ, who the Bible says, while we were still sinners, died for us. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And that's God's demonstrated love for us. And out of that love comes the love that we have uh, for our communities and all the world. And so in 1 Corinthians 13 verses 1 to 2, this is actually what they call the great love chapter. Uh, Paul reminds us that uh, without love, all the other works we do uh, lose their meaning. I'll read it to you now. 1 Corinthians 13 verses 1 to 2. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can even move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. So I would encourage you just to let that wash over you for a moment. The kind of things Paul is listing are the things that we celebrate uh, humanly speaking, the kind of gifts and things we look for and, and go after and, and, and look up to. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, if I speak like an angel, but I don't have love, it's just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Your eloquence doesn't matter if there is no love. If I have prophetic powers and I understand the deep mysteries of life and I have so much knowledge and I even have enough faith to be able to move a mountain, but I have not love, I'm nothing. That's a strong, strong push for love as the core and foundation of all that we do. Love is the central characteristic of the Christian community. And how does that love play itself out? How does that love work in our communities? That's what we're going to spend the next few minutes on. We want to begin, or at least I do, and uh, that's where we're going to begin because I'm doing this. We want to be, I want to begin with the idea of what we are responsible for and what we are not responsible for. If we read through the Bible, we will, we will find out that I am responsible for loving relationships. And I'm going to give you two verses. The first verse is Matthew chapter 5. Verses 23 to 24, and it says this. Jesus is speaking. He says, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. So if you're in the middle of bringing your offering, and you remember that you, it's, your brother has something against you. If you remember that, that you have caused some sort of rift in a relationship between you and a brother, if you, if you are responsible for causing a breakdown in the love between you and a, and a brother or sister in Christ, and I, and I would say for anybody, really, we could extrapolate that, then it is your responsibility. You caused the rift it's your responsibility to go and take care of that with the other person. In fact, this is quite strong. It says if you're in the middle of giving God his gift and you remember there's you did something to cause a rift between you and a brother, drop the gift and go take care of the person because the people are always most important. Remember, love is the center. Love is the core characteristic of the Christian community. So if you're offering your gift and remember your brother has something against you, go take care of it. Now, we're going to jump ahead several chapters to Matthew 18, verse 15. And here's what Jesus tells us here. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault just between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. So here the situation is reversed. If your brother sins against you. If your brother does something that creates a rift in the relationship, whose responsibility is it to do at that time? <laughs> I'm sorry to say, it's still yours. See, that's what the Bible says. I am responsible for the loving relationships. I am, whether or not I caused the rift or not, 
as a follower of Jesus Christ, I am responsible to be proactive and take the initiative to restore the relationship. Why? Because love is the central characteristic of the Christian community. And Christians are called to live in community. Our faith may be directly in Jesus, but we don't live alone. The New Testament is littered with references to how Christians treat each other, how we live together in community. And I'm going to give you quite a few right now. And, and I, I'm going to actually read these. I think there's, I've got uh, 44 here, I think. And what I'm going to do is just read them all to you, just snippets of the verses, just the very, you know, three to seven words that um, have the direction about how to treat each other uh, in Christian community as we live together. But the point I am trying to drive home by reading 44 of these to you is to show you that I'm not cherry picking a few verses, that this is a core message of the New Testament, of how we live together, how we treat each other. So just sit back, relax, don't close your eyes if you're driving. And here we go. Mark chapter 9, verse 50. Be at peace with each other. John 13, 14. Wash one another's feet. John 13, and then John 15 again. Love one another. You'll find that all over the place. Romans 13, verse 8. Love one another. Romans 12, verse 10. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Romans 12, verse 10 again. Honor one another above yourselves. Romans 12, verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Romans 14, 13. Stop passing judgment on one another. Romans 15, 7. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you. Romans 15, verse 14. Instruct one another. Romans 16, verse 16, and several other places, greet one another with a holy kiss. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 33, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. 1 Corinthians 12, 25, have equal concern for each other. Galatians 5, verse 13, serve one another in love. Galatians 6, verse 2, carry each other's burdens. Galatians 5 verse 15. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, you will be destroyed by each other. Galatians 5 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Ephesians 4 verse 2. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Ephesians 4 verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Again, Ephesians 4, verse 32. Forgiving each other, just as God in Christ forgave you. Ephesians 5, verse 19. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Ephesians 5, verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Philippians 2, verse 3. In humility... Consider others better than yourselves. Colossians 3, verse 9. Do not lie to each other. Colossians 3, verse 13. Bear with one another. And again, Colossians 3, verse 13. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Colossians 3, verse 16. Teach one another. Colossians 3, verse 16 again. Admonish one another. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 12. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 18 and several other places. Encourage one another. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. Build each other up. Hebrews 3, verse 13. Encourage one another daily. Hebrews 12, 24. Spur one another on toward love and good deeds. James 4, verse 11. Do not slander one another. James 5, verse 9. 
Do not grumble against each other. James 5, verse 16, confess your sins to each other. James 5, verse 16, pray for each other. 1 Peter 1, verses 22 and 4, verse 8, love one another deeply from the heart. 1 Peter 3, verse 8, live in harmony with one another. 1 Peter 5, verse 14, greet one another with a kiss of love. 1 Peter 4, verse 9, Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. 1 Peter 4, verse 10. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. 1 Peter 5, verse 5. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. 1 John 3, verse 11, verse 23, 4, verse 7, 11, 12, 2 John 5. Love one another. So you see, love is the foundation and the central characteristic of Christian community. And the practice of love is something that we grow in day by day as we live together and study the scriptures and meet in Christian community and pray together and learn from the word what it means to really live in a loving community. We'll stop there. Part one discussion question is this. Pick one of these each others above and talk about why it is important. And I'll see you in seven seconds. All right. This edition of Dig Deeper is going to take a different road. It's going to go and veer away from where we went in the sermon, the message from last Sunday, July 20th, 2014. So you might want to go back and listen to that also, because you're going to hear some different stuff. I want to take one section of this Bible study, this edition of Dig Deeper, to talk specifically about caring for the poor. And what I want to do is I want to uh, I want to dig more deeply into it because it's it's not a simple issue caring for the poor isn't. It's it's uh any of you who have lived around any sort of poverty or have thought about the problems of poverty know that it's it's not a particularly simple issue. And so what I want to do is go through some scripture passages with you that describe uh, both the ideal of the Christian community in caring for the poor and what realistically happens in the Christian community as we try to care for each other and especially the poor among us. So to begin with, uh, I want to look at Acts 2 verse 42, or excuse me, verse 45. And in the example of the early church, Luke, the author of Acts, writes about how they operated as a church. And in Acts 2, verse 45, he says this, And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. As any had need. So we have people who are taking care of each other, including monetarily. They are uh, willing to even sell their possessions as they have need. And then James, uh, written later, also talks about uh, what it is to follow Jesus Christ. And this is what he writes. James chapter 1, verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction, which of course would mean caring for them as well, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And so in the early church, we have the, uh, we have the, um, the value, the ideal of everybody caring for everybody. We have people sharing with whoever has need. That's not just a New Testament idea. God's word has always called on people who want to be faithful followers of God to care for the poor. 
In Leviticus chapter 23, verse 22, for instance, we have some instructions for how people are to harvest their field. And this is what it says. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor should you go back and gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. And so here, the uh, obviously the people who are uh, who own the land are the ones that would benefit from going over the land a second time to pick up all the the gleanings are the droppings the the extra is left over after the harvest. And obviously this the person who is the wealthy landowner would benefit from instructing his harvesters, the paid uh, farm workers to to harvest right to the edge of the land. And God says to the the people who own the land, you are not to squeeze the last little bit out of the land for yourself. You are to leave some of that for the poor people among you and for the wanderers who are traveling through the land. You're not supposed to harvest right up to the edge of the field. Leave some of that. Obviously, that's very conveniently got by the travelers, right? And then don't go back over your field again to pick up all the gleanings, all the droppings, uh, the extra stuff that didn't get harvested. Leave that for the poor people in your land to go back and pick up so that everybody, other people may not be wealthy, but they were not going to starve either. And in fact, um, that is God's design is that nobody uh, starves. Deuteronomy chapter 15 verses 4 to 5 says this, But there will be no poor among you, for the Lord will bless you in the land that your Lord, your God, is giving you for an inheritance to possess. If only you will strictly obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all this commandment that I command you today. And so he says that there's not going to be starving people among you. There's not going to be destitute people among you. If you operate this way, if even though you're the landowner, if you instruct your reapers to leave the gleanings and to not, you know, reap the field right to the edge, uh, but but leave that for other people to come and get. And of course, they have to display a certain amount of initiative and industry on their own to go get the gleanings. And so that also uh, gives them both. Um, an incentive not simply to beg and also gives them a certain amount of dignity to be able to go back and pick up their own food uh, even if it is uh, uh, going to gather the gleanings from the field. In Deuteronomy 15 11 which is only just a few verses past what I just read it doesn't <laughs> God's not saying there's not going to be income differential and in people of different means, because here he says, For there will never cease to be poor in the land, therefore I commend you. You shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. And so there, there is an acknowledgement that there are going to be poor people for all sorts of reasons, all sorts of reasons for people to be poor. Uh, but they are not to be destitute, and you're to operate your... Uh, family and your land in ways that leave nobody destitute. What I just read said, you shall open wide your hand to the brother and to the needy and to the poor. Take care of people. And moving just a, a few chapters on there, Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 14 to 15 says this, you shall not oppress the hired worker who is poor and needy, whether he's one of your brothers or one of the sojourners who are in your land within your towns. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, because he is poor and he counts on that, lest he cry against you to the Lord and you be guilty of sin. And so not only are the people who, who are sort of the, the people who own the businesses, who own the land, this is obviously agriculture, but I think it speaks to people of all businesses. Not only are they not to squeeze the thing so tightly there's nothing left for the poor, but they're to make sure they treat their uh, laborers well and not oppress them uh, just because they have the power, right? Uh, make, you pay them at the end of the day. Obviously, you could withhold that or, you know, there's all sorts of things people of means can do to people without means. 
And, and God says, that is not the way you are to act as my people. And it doesn't matter whether he's a Jew who lives with you or a foreigner who happens to be in the land at that time and is working in your field. You give them their wages at the end of the day before the sun sets because that's the way it works. And you are not to oppress them or treat them unfairly. So in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, we have this idea of there will be people who uh, are poor among us, people of lesser means and lesser power uh, because they have lesser means. But the call is to take care of them and to treat them well and to look out for them. Now, here comes the catch. Because... Different people operate from different values. Different people have different work ethics. Different people uh, live their lives with different amounts of wisdom and different amounts of fiscal discipline, right? And so I'm going to spend a few minutes going through some other passages that show us that um, that even though we have talked about the ideal, the way God would have things be in his community, the early church, just like the Old Testament times, was no utopia. They struggled with all the, the, uh, the inner brokenness of humankind that gets in the way today. Uh, the first story I want to share with you that points out uh, the... The, the brokenness in the human heart of wanting to be perceived as very generous when you're really not that generous is from a couple named Ananias and Sapphira. And, Ananias, and this all takes place in the early church. Remember the Acts passage where everybody's, you know, when people have needs, somebody will sell a piece of land or whatever and give the money to the church to care for the poor, right? And so this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, sold a piece of their land. And here's what happened. It's in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. A man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried his body out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. And Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. You can imagine great fear coming upon the whole church, huh? The thing I want to zoom in on here is it's not the punishment, uh, uh, extreme though it seems in this instance. What I want to zoom in on is verse 4 in particular. It's the deceitfulness of Ananias and Sapphira and Peter's conversation with them. L listen to what Peter says. It's a verse four. He says, while it remained unsold, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? So why have you contrived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to men, but to God. We misconstrue this passage if we say that if you sell a piece of land to give to the church, you have to give all the money to the church. 
that is not at all what's happening. What's happening is that Ananias and Sapphira wanted to appear very generous, like they sold a piece of land to, and gave it all to God, to the church, to care for the poor. But they didn't. They lied to the Holy Spirit. And Peter's very clear when he says, listen, nobody told you to do this. There's no law about this. It was your land before you sold it. And once you sold it, all the money in the bag was yours too. So why did you like not just give half of it and say, we gave half of it, you know? That's the problem here, is the deceitful donation. It, it's not that it's not that they should have given the whole thing. It's that they shouldn't have lied about what they were giving for the sake of their appearances. And so here we have uh, the first of several points at which we find out the early church was no utopia, that the sins of the broken human heart have infected the church from the very beginning. And if we expect to somehow attain to what Peter wrote in Acts 2 verse 45, about everybody, where do you, let's see, uh, everybody selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. If we expect to attain to that, we uh, have a unrealistic expectation because the church is made up of humans. And Jesus said he came to seek and to save the lost. And it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. So the church is filled with people who need spiritual doctoring, and these kind of things happen. So caring for the poor. One of the things we don't want to do is be disingenuous as we do things and reach out in different ways to care for the poor, as Ananias and Sapphira were. Because as Peter reminds us, the, 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 the treasure, the, the money, the property, it's ours. We are the stewards of it. It's not doesn't belong to everybody. It belongs to us to deal with and to deal out as as we are moved and as we see fit and as we decide. And so uh, we are responsible for how we do that. So it's ours to deal with. The, uh, there's no claim that the other person makes on the property that is ours to deal with. So that's the first thing I would say. Uh, it's yours to deal with. It's not others to make a claim on it to you. So the second thing, the second little instance we have is an instance about uh, the distribution of food to the poor people who are living uh, among the churchgoers. And it, it goes like this. It's Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So the Hellenists, by the way, are the Greeks. Those would be the non-Jews, right? And the complaint arose uh, that by some of the Greek Christians uh, that the Hebrew poor were getting uh, more or were not getting skipped or were being more some, something about it seemed inequitable between the Greek speaking, the Greek Jews and the Hebrew, the, excuse me, the Greek Christians and the Hebrews. And so here we have uh, an inequality uh, uh, between the distribution and Following this, the disciples realized they needed, this was really just a matter of organization, and the disciples were trying to do too much, and so they appointed some other people to take care of the uh, the distribution of food to people, because that's the way it would work. They would hand out the daily, you know, here's your food for today kind of thing, and so everybody had all that stuff in common, and the disciples decided that it was disorganization that was making this happen. And so they organized it and appointed leaders who were godly men who would make sure this didn't keep happening. But uh, nonetheless, it's important to see that these things happen and sometimes they're nobody's fault. They just uh, happen that way. But that doesn't mean they don't need to be rectified. They do. And then the third thing, one, one more thing that we see in the early church is that you... you just, you know, you know, human nature, you're a human after all. Um, and people need motivation to work. Some people need more motivation than others. 
and uh, some people uh, are not so motivated. And and if you get a if you're living in community, a real kind of a a real community, a commune really is what they were doing. And so everybody just kind of shared everything with everybody. You know, some people are going to be more active in providing for the community than others. And that certainly happened in the early church. And one place it happened was in the church in Thessalonica. And Paul writes to the Christians in Thessalonica about this problem of some people not being willing to to work, to do their fair share, to bring in uh, income to the community. And here's what he writes. It's it's first it's second Thessalonians three verses 10 through 12. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone's not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but being busy bodies. Now such a person we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and earn their own living. And so once again, there's no, there is, the community has a responsibility to care for the people, but the people don't really have like a claim on the assets and the resources of the community. Uh, and, and those who won't work uh, should not be enabled to not work if they are able to work because then they're just, uh, well, Paul says they're walking in idleness. So, so to put this together and, and kind of sum it up in, uh, in, in a short way, what we've kind of been through about the idea of of helping people and and, and uh, caring for the poor, and yet realizing that um, we need to do that systematically because otherwise these inequities can develop, and we also recognize that people will take advantage of that, and that we are not called to let people take advantage of us. So how do we sum this all up? This this is one way I would sum it up. And and maybe, you know, if you're looking for an extra question because you run out of discussion questions, try to sum up in a sentence or two uh, the principles we covered in the Care for the Poor. But here's how I would set it up. Summing up, I am responsible to care for you and to share with you as needed, including my money. But you do not have a right to claim a share of what is under my stewardship as your own or for your use. And so the stuff really is under my stewardship and it's my responsibility to use it in love for the community, but I'm under no obligation to uh, support people who are able to support themselves and are unwilling to. That's where we're gonna end with uh, care for the poor. And the part two discussion question is this. Talk about how you experience people at intersections with signs asking for money. What's that like when you pull up to the intersection and see that? How do you feel? What goes through your mind? And I will see you in seven seconds. Now that I threw that question out, I just want to add one more thing is that uh, homelessness is a problem with a wide variety of causes and solutions. And um, if you haven't ever looked into how people get homeless, why they're homeless, how they move through it and uh, get back on track with their fiscal lives and their home line, you know, having a home and that kind of thing, it is worth looking into a little bit because if you've never looked into it and you've just sort of formed some opinions off the top of your head, I'd be willing to bet that you would be very, very surprised at uh, some of the ways that people have ended up needing the help of the community, whether it's through Salvation Army or standing on the side of the road with a sign, or whatever other community help there is. Uh, Obviously, there are a certain number of people who uh, don't really want to work, but there's all sorts of others out there in all sorts of situations. So, that being said, 
we move on to part three, which also we're not really addressing in the sermon. And that is caring for our environment, caring for our environment. And the Bible does have some things to say about caring for our environment. And we can certainly infer some other things about caring for our environment as well. To start with, uh, let's talk about man's place in creation. Genesis 1 verse 26 says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So here we see that God made man for what the Bible calls dominion. But if we explore through the scriptures what God means by dominion, he doesn't mean to use for one's selfish pleasure. It means to rule over with care. Uh, when the kings have dominion over the land, the people are not there to... Uh, be used by the king for the king's pleasure. The king is there as the protector and leader of the people. And so God has made us the protector and leader of the world. That's really what's going on here. Genesis 2 verse 15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And so God, so, so man is, even before the fall into sin, man is put in, in the garden to tend it, to take care of it. Not to, you know, uh, um, well, anyway, I'm, we'll, we'll get down there in a minute. But, but he's put in the garden to work it and keep it. Now, one of the things the Bible says that I think bears on our idea of how we care for the environment. First is that we have dominion. We have this caring rule over the earth. It's, it's a, it's, we're supposed to be tending it and looking out for it. That's what the dominion's about. And then God reminds us that it's not really ours anyway. We are here as, yes, stewards. The same word, right? All summer long. What's the word for the summer? Stewardship. Leviticus 25, they had some very interesting land ownership laws. In fact, they didn't have any land ownership laws. They had land occupancy laws and land lease laws, really. And here's why. In Leviticus 25, verse 23, the law says, The land shall, this is God speaking, by the way, in God's voice. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. You are strangers and sojourners with me. And and uh, land and and slaves and I don't want to divert off into that, but all the, all the things that were the property, land and slaves, were not the owners in perpetuity. They they uh, had them for a certain time and then they were released. Even land, and if you if you bought a piece of land, it was only yours until the year of Jubilee, when all the land went back to its ancestral families of ownership. And so nobody really owned the land. Everybody was leasing. Why? Because of what we just read in Leviticus 25 verse 23. Because God reserved ownership for himself. We are all stewards. And in fact, caring for not just our own needs, but for the needs of others, uh, extends all the way down to the servants and the animals and the land. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. It's the command about having a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Here it is. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son, or your daughter, or your male servant, or your female servant, or your ox, or your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates, so that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. 
Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. The Sabbath, part of what the Sabbath is, is to remind us that we are stewards and not owners. That God, all the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That's our theme verse for the whole series. And here we see God reminding people of this Sabbath. And one of the things the Sabbath does for us is forces us to quit demanding labor of those from whom we demand labor on the other days. Our, uh, our sons and daughters, our female and male servants, the oxes or donkeys or anybody, or even sojourners, non-Jews who are working in our fields, still get the day off. They take a Sabbath to the Lord. Why? To remind us that none of this really belongs to us to be used willy-nilly and wantonly as we wish. We are stewards of the land and stewards of all that is underneath us. In Proverbs, we are reminded that uh, God's people take good care of all things, not just people. Proverbs 12 verse 10 says this, The righteous care for the needs of their animals, but the kindest acts of the wicked are cruel. And so right there, God is pointing out to us, and, and this is drawn again out of the idea of dominion. Dominion isn't domination. It is caring rule. And the righteous, uh, Solomon says in Proverbs, the righteous care for their needs of their animals. And, and I know somebody who has uh, been a police photographer and they have uh, done uh, crime scenes of animal cruelty. And they say it's just quite horrible uh, the way people treat animals. And, and it's, it's this idea of how we treat people who are powerless to retaliate or animals that are powerless to retaliate. This is all part of our care of the earth and the environment as part of our care for the community. Here's, here's what I would say about caring for the environment itself. We've talked a lot about animals already, uh, but what I, what I would say about uh, the environment is this. Caring for the environment is about caring for all mankind and, and indeed everything on the earth. Polluted water and air, overfishing, ozone depletion and everything like that. Uh, I, and I'm not saying which of those things is really, you know, happening or, or whatever. I'm not trying to get into debates about uh, climate change and all that stuff. But what I'm saying is that it's not an option to not care about the environment because the environment, uh, well, we're going to get to some other things, but one thing is the environment affects the people and the animals that we have already talked about caring about. And it affect, and, and uh, environmental problems tend to affect the poor disproportionately because of their lack of power and resources to, uh, to fight for their, uh, their position on the issue. You, you know, for a lot of uh, unattractive things like landfills and, and uh, power plants and things, the word is NIMBY, right? Not in my backyard. Well, you know whose backyard they go in. They go, in, they go near the poor people who can't afford the lawyers to fight things off, right? And so a part of caring uh, for the environment and being aware of all these things is caring for the powerless people among us who bear the brunt of the abuse of the environment. Here's a quote from a, uh, this is a Christian site called the blessedearth.org. Environmental degradation affects first and most harshly the poor and marginalized, those who, those with no voice and no power, exactly those whom Christians are called to defend and love. Our great commandment is to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. And so part of caring for the environment is caring for the people affected by the environment. But I don't think that's the only thing, actually. I, I think there's another piece of it also. And, and the other piece of it is that the creation is God's creative work. And, and again, I'm not, 
I'm not here to advocate like going back to live in, you know, Adobe huts or, or anything. I'm not, that's, I don't want to go that direction. What I'm talking about is our values and, and what, the way we need to think about the earth, not the conclusions we come to when we think about the earth that way. I'm talking about the way we think about the earth. And, and when we look at the earth, what we see is that, that the universe is God's creative work and it proclaims his glory. In Genesis, over and over and over, we see the refrain, God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. And actually, it's kind of amazing because after mankind is created, God says that it's very good. But it's good. It's good. It's good. God has created a beautiful universe and a, a beautiful earth. And when we abuse the environment, we deface God's work of art, I, I would say. And I'm not talking about nature worship. Uh, uh, but I am talking about honoring nature just as we care for other works of art. My kids make me beautiful works of art and, and I have many of them on my desk and I, I wouldn't dream of just, you know, uh, uh, using them for a, a tire stop on my car or when I'm changing my oil or something. They're works of art. They're to be treated with, with respect and, the, and, and, uh, and honor for the love that went into them. And, and the creation, the world is the same way. It's to be treated with respect and honor for the love and the creativity that went into it uh, as God created it and saw that it was good and saw that it was good and saw that it was good. And the earth is here to proclaim God's glory. Isaiah 6 verse 3 says, And they were calling to one another, these are angels, and they were calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And, and when we, when we trash the earth, I think we are trashing God's work of art. I think we are diminishing his glory. And, uh, um, again, I I've said this about 10 times. I don't want to get into the details because a lot of those details, uh, people have arrived legitimately at different conclusions. The, but the thing I'm driving home is not caring is not an option for the Christian not caring is not an option for the Christian. Psalm 19 verse 1 says this, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And so again, we see that the earth is God's creative work. And why would we uh, trash and disrespect the creative work of the God who loves us so much that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. We are stewards of our community. We're, we are uh, stewards of our human community. And for the Christian, the core attribute of that community is love. And each of us is responsible to take the initiative to make love at the center, whether or not we're the one who created the rift, we are responsible to move love and reconciliation and peace to the center again. We are stewards of our community and we are stewards of the poor. We are to care for the poor, uh, but that is not, uh, that, that is not in a way that is slovenly or, or without due process and wisdom and letting ourselves be taken advantage of. But again, the possibility of being taken advantage of does not relieve us of the responsibility of caring for the poor. And the same thing with the earth, with, with the animals and the earth itself for our environment. God has indeed given us dominion, but it's not to dominate. It's to rule with care and love over all this beautiful, wonderful world God has created and put into our hands. That's the end of today's edition of Dig Deeper. Thanks for listening. Our discussion questions are these. Number one, pick another one of the each others from part one and talk about why it's meaningful to you. Number two, how have you experienced care for the poor as frustrating or rewarding or both? Number three, Christians have a wide variety of views with regard to caring for the environment. How are you taught growing up? 
And how have your views changed if they have? And of course, since I'm not the arbiter of all things good to discuss, I always end with question. the last question being, what else struck you? I'm Pastor John Rollison from Journey of Life Lutheran Church in Orlando, Florida. You've been listening to Dig Deeper, our weekly Bible study. It's available on YouTube. It's available as audio download. There is printable material that goes with it. It can all be found on our website, www.journeyoflife.org. Thanks for listening, and God bless you.